oily fish consumption is very clearly associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality from cardiovascular disease. And this is particularly strong in those who've already had cardiovascular disease. So what we see is for about every 20 gram increase in oily fish a day, this is associated with a 4% reduction in cardiovascular disease. And what we also see from some of these really big studies is if people are having no oily fish versus those that are having two or more oily fish portions a week, you can see actually an 80% reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease. And this is, this is huge. Um, now, there's also been some studies that have concluded that the effects of fish oil supplements are really small when it comes to cardiovascular disease and also mortality rates. The most significant research, I think, that people often talk about came from a meta-analysis of 37 clinical trials. So this is basically a study that looked at all of the data from 37 different clinical trials. And this was including, therefore, hundreds of thousands uh, of participants. And this research found that increasing the EPA and DHA omega-3 provided very little, if any, benefit on most of the health outcomes that they looked at. So that's rather shocking, isn't it? Uh, you were just explaining all of these fantastic benefits, and then they've looked at this enormous set of studies, and they said, well, it doesn't um, work. And, you know, uh, we actually checked just before this, and, uh, you know, many governments, including the UK and the US, are actively encouraging their citizens to increase their omega-3 intake from oily fish. So does that suggest that the latest science is really at odds with this advice? And does it mean that, you know, we should all stop encouraging our, our children to, you know, eat that salmon on your plate? No, um, absolutely not. Because we also have many trials that show a very clear benefit of omega-3. So for example, there's the Reduce It trial, which was in 8,000 people where participants were given a purified version of a really high dose of EPA omega-3, or they were given a placebo capsule. And what we found was those who received the EPA omega-3 had much lower heart attacks, they had less strokes, they had less need for a procedure to open clogged arteries, and they even even had much less death compared to the people taking the placebo. So Sarah, I think most people listening to this will be really surprised there can be this level of disagreement on something that isn't brand new, but actually there have been massive studies. So how can you have like one trial showing a really big impact? And then this other thing where you said there's this big, what they call sort of meta-analysis, you said, so looking at all these trials saying that there's no impact. Like how can that be? And is that very unusual in nutritional science? No, not at all. And Jonathan, I actually think that all the best nutritional scientists have a lot of healthy disagreement. So firstly, unlike in the GISI trial, which showed a benefit of omega-3, in recent studies, most of the participants were already taking statins. And so if they're already taking all of these drugs that are preventing the outcomes that we're looking at, so these cardiovascular outcomes, is it surely no surprise that we don't see any added benefit from adding omega-3 into the diet? We also need to think about the dose and the type of omega-3. So, for example, in the Reduce It trial that I just talked about that showed a benefit, despite actually in that study they having a high statin use, the dose of EPA that they gave was exceptionally high, so way beyond what you would get naturally with oily fish intake. And also, the baseline characteristics of the participants really seems to matter. So what we know is for people that have a, quite a high triglycerides in their blood, the evidence I think is fairly consistent that EPA and DHA omega-3 are beneficial. And I also think for people that have a low EPA and DHA omega-3 intake or low fish oil intake, the evidence I think is fairly consistent that there is a benefit in those individuals. So again, it's taking us back to thinking about exactly what we're giving them, how much we're giving them, who the individual is and what they're already eating. So I think you're presenting quite a quite a complex picture where you're saying there's certain people for whom this is beneficial. Um, you said particularly people with high triglycerides, which is sort of really like all the total level of fats in your in your blood. Is that is that the right way to think about it simply, Sarah? Yeah. So we know that EPA and DHA taken by people with high triglycerides has a really 
good triglyceride lowering effect. And it can be in the region of around 30 to up to 45%. And this is shown from quite robust randomized clinical trials. And I was going to say that, you know, the, the, the one thing I do know about this is that we actually measure this level of triglycerides, right, this level of blood fat after a meal as, as part of the standard test that everybody does who does Zoe. So we've done this for, you know, more than 50,000 people. And I think what was, like, you know, sort of a surprise at the beginning of this is this huge variation in those levels in people who are, you know, healthy, not people who have um, cardiovascular disease. So there are lots of people with very low levels of triglyceride, right, uh, Sarah? And there are also some people, we see roughly, I would say about a, th a third, I think, where those levels after meals are really quite high and enough to really change um, sort of sort of the advice. So is, is that the same way of thinking about this? So you're, it's going to be quite personalized. There'll be people, therefore, for whom... This doesn't really make a difference, but there will be, you know, quite a significant but a minority of people with these high triglycerides levels where those are the people where you believe this omega-3 could make a difference. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. And Jonathan, I think it, there's also the situation where people may have low fasting triglycerides, but they have a very high post-meal triglyceride response. And our research that we've conducted at King's quite clearly shows that if you add fish oil or, or EPA and DHA omega-3 to your diet, you can reduce, even with people that have normal fasting triglycerides, this post-meal uh, triglyceride response. Are there any other benefits um, from these omega-3s? Yeah, so I think there's really good evidence from all sorts of kinds of trials that adding EPA and DHA omega-3 and fish oil into the diet reduces blood pressure. It improves blood vessel function. But really importantly, it has a very potent anti-inflammatory role. And we actually know most chronic diseases now that are impacting Western populations, such as type 2 diabetes, some cancers and cardiovascular disease, is underpinned by chronic inflammation. There's a lot of evidence to support omega-3 and there's a lot of evidence against it. Can you settle this once and for all? Is there something fishy going on here? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a terrible joke, but, you know, I, I managed to get it in. I've thrown you off completely. Oh, my Go on, Sarah. gosh. <laughs> so, Jonathan, there is nothing fishy going on here, in my opinion. Um I think that the evidence is really robust showing that EPA and DHA omega-3 and fish oil have favourable impacts on lots of mechanisms that underpin chronic diseases. I think it's really clear, like I said, that they have anti-inflammatory roles, that they have roles in reducing triglycerides. I think that if we want to think of the long-term benefits, I think it's quite clear that for people who don't consume adequate amounts of oily fish or supplemental EPA and DHA omega-3, that there will be a benefit from including them in their diet. And I also believe that there is an added benefit for people that do have high fasting triglycerides as well. So Sarah, you've talked a lot about the potential um, health benefits here. Now, I know that Tim would be quite sceptical, actually, if he was sitting here. And I think there's a couple of reasons, as I understand it. One is, I think, a very big environmental uh, argument about the, you know, the massive overfishing and I think his concerns that sort of the farm fish are much less um, healthy than people think. Um, and then I think he'd have a different argument, which is to say a lot of these studies are on people who are eating really quite unhealthy diets. And actually, if they just shifted to a really gut healthy, you know, primarily plant-based diet, you'd get the same benefits and you wouldn't be worrying about, you know, can I eat these these fish? How much of that argument would you be willing to accept? So can we start with farm fish versus uh, non-farmed fish, which is something people often ask about? So interestingly, farmed fish actually has more omega-3 than fresh fish. Now, this is because farmed fish are fatter. So they just have a lot more oil in. So it does mean that they also have a lot more omega-6. Um, and there is some questions as to regarding whether they have as much of the other healthy components, some of the nutrients that you mentioned earlier. So we touched on the fact they're high in vitamin D, high in iodine and selenium. So I think I would say, though, the jury's kind of out there um, on that. I think it's really important to recognise that fresh fish can be very expensive. And I think that if we're encouraging people, which I would, to consume oily fish 
in their diet if it's acceptable to them that actually some very cheap alternatives like frozen salmon do often come from farmed sources and I believe it's better to have frozen farmed salmon than no salmon in the diet in my opinion. Now surely it's better that actually people just have generally an overall healthy diet um, and if they have an overall healthy diet that will negate potentially any downside of not having omega-3 or fish oil in their diet. And I think to use vegans and vegetarians is a fantastic example for this. So there's something called the omega-3 index, which is basically a way that we can measure in someone's blood what their intake of omega-3 is. And this is it's really great for us as nutritionists because what's the hardest thing for us to do, as you know, Jonathan, is to actually accurately say what people are eating. It's blooming difficult to do that. Yeah. But what is fabulous about omega-3 is the only way we can have it in our blood is if we've eaten it. And omega-3 incorporates into our red blood cell membranes. So what's fantastic is we can take a blood sample from someone, we can measure the levels of EPA and DHA in their red blood cell membranes, and we can say exactly what their intake is. And then from that, we can say what your omega-3 index is. And what we know is that the omega-3 index, which is basically saying how high or low your omega-3 intake is over a long period of time, is very low in vegans is intermediate in vegetarians because they may consume some eggs, for example, and is quite high in many omnivores. Now, what we do know is that despite that, vegetarians and vegans do have lower risk of cardiovascular disease compared to uh, omnivores, people that consume meat or people that consume animal products. Now, is that because actually omega-3 doesn't have any effect, it's all a load of nonsense. I don't believe so. I believe it's because, just like Tim says, so I will agree with him a little bit on this, that's very good evidence to show even though they don't get enough EPA and DHA or, or um, omega-3, that actually all the other aspects of their diet, the fact they have more fibre, the fact that they're not having high saturated fat, you know, lower so salt intake, etc. All of these other benefits, I think, outweigh the fact that therefore they're not getting omega-3 in their diet. Now, what we don't know and what I'd love to be able to answer is, what if we took those vegans and vegetarians and gave them an omega-3 supplement, would we see an even greater improvement in their reduction of risk? I think we probably would, and that would be really interesting.